this is this is uh, season two of talking about, and during this season, we talk to some of the wonderful people uh, of uh, the arts, uh, culture, and uh, everything to do with the performing arts and not performing arts. And today, it is honestly my greatest pleasure to be talking to uh, Professor Anis. That's how he would like to be uh, known as. And he said, if you want to know more, you can always Google. <laughs> Professor Anis and I go a long way back. In fact, I know Professor Anis before I even know Joe Hashem. So that's how long ago it had been. Welcome, Professor Anis, or Dr. Anis, as I call you most of the time. Welcome to KLPSC and welcome to Talking About. Thank you. And I am looking forward to having this um, wonderful conversation with you because you are a person with so much, so, so much knowledge of the art, really, so much. Uh, this half an hour uh, session may not definitely be enough to cover everything, but it will certainly whet the appetite for those listeners and the viewers who would like to know more. So, Dr. Anis, how did it all begin for you? Well, it began way back in UM in the mid-70s. Um, I was destined to take up diplomacy, diplomatic studies, or and then follow up with law degree. But I met a very wonderful person who changed it, changed my life, Christian Jit. Oh, so it was Christian. So you could have been an ambassador. I could have been an ambassador. I could have been a lawyer, but uh, that was my passion when I was uh, in school. Uh, but Christian actually painted a completely new picture, and it was very interesting how it moved me towards performing arts. Not because it is new, it has been with me, but I had no idea that one could go beyond that. Did so, you study performing arts in school? No, I, I, I was very active in the performing arts in school through my parents. My parents were both school teachers and ah. they were, you know, doing dancing and theatre and mm, all that. So don't it, get and all that. All that. So oh. I was very from small, I was involved. So I was very passionate about it already in school. And then I guess uh, it was at university I found a way out to pursue. It was very trial. It was very experiential. It was really a discourse that is completely pioneering. But Nobody. Christian, Christian is a historian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a historian. That's why it's good. Because when he talks about a place in Southeast Asia and postmodern place and modern place, his um, diachronic analysis is just superb. You know, this is what happens in theatre studies. Um, while we talk about the extent, the presence, the extent, I guess, um, uh, doesn't circumvallate but embraces the past in very interesting ways. So if theatre is thought just being from the point of view of the present, with just history as being an appendix, I don't think it brings a lot of meaning to the younger students. And to me, that was very precious. Uh, his, his analytical mind, historical analysis and the configuration of construction of ideas uh, was just thrilling and I was really impressed. When you were in school, uh, was the performing art, was uh, literature, was, uh, were, were subjects like that still being taught or has it all been taken out of the... No, when I was, you know, I was in school, in English schools, um, we had to do a lot of things that was uh, part of the co-curriculum, part of the curriculum. In fact, in, in high school, I, was, I majored in English literature. I was more interested in history. Um, I was interested in Islamic history. No one wants to get We took it, a group of us took it on our own. We got A in that, you know, for our HSC exam. I, I'm just someone who loves to do something passionately and not having to really be rigid about certain be things. Yeah, into it. yeah. So I guess with the, with whether the school has it or not, I would form my own group. I would get my counsellors and teachers to support me. And all the while, when I was in Sultan Abdul Hamid College, my last school before I came to University of Malaya, um, yeah, I had very good um, support from the principal, from the assistant principal. And that put me in a position where I thought, yeah, I could do something with the arts, but I have no idea how. Ah, you know. I see. I, I, but University of Malaya, 
uh, I'm sure at that time, was a very strong institution for the arts, right? Yes, yes. Uh, were you one of the dancers the, of the, Kasuma? Yeah, I was in Kasuma. I was, <laughs> I was in the University of Malaya Cultural Troupe. I was there for all my three years of life as an undergraduate. Continued again when I was a graduate student as the uh, choreographer instructor. And then continued again when I came back from Hawaii uh, to become their principal teacher. Continued again when I set up the performing arts program in UM to make Kasuma to be a permanent ensemble in mm. the uh, dance degree program rather than core curriculum. So Kasuma became the embodiment of the traditional ensemble of Malaysia vis-a-vis -vis another group called UMA Dance, which means UM Dance Company, which is a contemporary dance oh. company. So these are now, I put them together, so I left behind at is it least... still alive? Yeah, it is. Oh, wonderful. They, they have great works. They at have every, least and, that's a wonderful legacy to be proud of. Right. Well, I leave it to the others to make it work. Yeah. La, you know, I've yeah. done it already. Sometimes you have to watch from afar, you know. I mean, you build the palaces and the castles and then you have no idea uh, whether they're going to renovate it or move whatever bricks they want, you know. So. But in your blood, I mean, flowing through your, your veins, uh, uh, Dr. Anis, obviously, um, you've, got, you've got many strengths, but two of them is that you are a researcher, right? Yes. And you are also a practitioner. Yes. How would the two mm -hmm. uh, work out for you? Mm -hmm. Which is your favoured? Mm -hmm. um, you know? <laughs> Good question. I, I was a practitioner first and foremost. La, you know, I love to perform. I love to dance, play music and do acting, dramatics and all that. But when I went back to graduate school and realised that, you know, uh, the research component part of, of that part of the world is so important, especially for here in Malaysia. Um, I, uh, I was very, you know, I was delirious almost to the point. I said, where have all this gone? What has happened wow. to this country? You know, and I was very passionate about it. Yeah. So I, I decided that either I work on R&D and publication, or there is no one at that point who keep this memory alive until we have the new cohorts today. Uh, we have many artists, and I was performing with many groups, and we love performing, but the ephemerality of it, you know, once it's gone, it's, it's done, or the author is dead at the open, it's performed, you know, there is the empowering goes to whom? It's not really the creator, but perhaps to the gazers, and that if the gazers are not educated enough, not literate enough, it just passes through. So that memory cycle cannot be recollected, you know. So uh, in my point of view, of course, uh, yeah. it is very important to be able to transcribe this yeah. in, in the best way for a certain cohort of readers. Yeah. So they will carry forward that memory and produce more. How, many, how many books have you written? I have authored more than 30-some books and about 200 publications. Heavens! Yes, I have. What a feat! No, really, I'm really disappointed because uh, my, my writings are mostly in English. And our Malaysian students, you know, today, you know, uh, I do not know what's happening to them. They don't read English text. I know. So they, they, know. they, they don't read and they, they, it's unfortunate, you know, sadly, so sadly, very sad. Sadly. So I, I have because, to preach again, yeah. you know, so it's that is why I feel a bit disappointed. Yeah, it is a, a very sad state of affairs and uh, it, can, it should not be allowed to, to continue that way mm -hmm. because there's millions of uh, literature mm -hmm. that would go past them because sure. they don't know the language. Precisely. Um, now, as a practitioner then, uh, Dr. Anis, how, the question just now was, how do you Connect. blend the two or manage the okay. two? You've talked about your research, your love for research. Mm -hmm. uh, what about your love for being a practitioner? <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I, I'm an ethnologist. You know, I'm an ethnomusicologist and ethnochoreologist. If people are wondering what these two big words are or small <laughs> words are, yeah, I can't even pronounce it. Ethnomusicology them. is all about the study of music as culture, I mean, the manifestation of music in culture. So what people do with music rather than what music do to people. You know, what people make with music. It's, a, it's more a, a, the anthropology of music. I should repeat that because it's such a lovely... <laughs> what people do with music rather than what music does to people. Uh -huh. la, you know, it's, it's very a cultural thing. And basically, you know, you don't, people don't really talk about what the Malayali do, uh, do with the music, what would the Chiti, uh, Pranakan Chiti does. I mean, all this is so important to us. We talk about an aboric structure. We talk about system coming down to tell us what to do, but it doesn't touch our heart. So ethnomusicology is sort of looking from the emic, the insider point of view. 
Now, ethnochorology is, is, uh, is a sibling of that. It is in dance. Choreology means movement, right? So it is the same way of looking dance as the embodiment of a cultural expression. So what it says, you know, for example, you talk about Taipusam itself, and then you talk about Kadi, Kavadi, you talk Kavadi Atom. You know, how many people in Malaysia understand Kavadi Atom? No. But Kavadi Atom is so very important in the Tamil culture, you know, that, you know, the whole structure of the trancing and dancing and musicking is embodied in the whole system. Big, big meaning. Yeah, but then how you make it simple? That's a task. The task of the scholar is to make it easy to be understood, leave the jargon out, but bring it back and then reincarnate it. And now that's the next question. Yeah. The reincarnation is my practicing. I reincarnate it back in the way I would try to find a pedagogical structure that's easy for all cohorts of age. And for example, when I did Zapin, the same thing, you know, I, uh, I, only, I only would go into reconstructing something that I'm familiar and very deeply engaged through my knowledge ability and through my language. So when I did the Randai reconstruction here way back in the 1982-83 to bring Randai up, you know, I was already almost, I had spent more than so many years in West Sumatra. I was speaking Minangkabau, not the Negri Milan version, but the classic Minang, Minangkabau to be able to understand the literature. Mm. And when I did the Zapin, you know, I had to go to all the outer islands and there were a lot of problems because the Bengalis people from Sulat Panjang and the Riau people are not going to speak the same lingua franca called the Johor Linga because they do have the colloquial structure, which means the connectivity of the performance is to the lingua franca rather than the big bahasa Indonesia. Are you the only one of a kind that Malaysia has created? I don't think so. I, I mean, because <laughs> this is such a great uh, piece of knowledge that uh, you have created for yourself. Um, you know, you don't just learn it from University of Malaya yeah. and then forget about it, or from books and then forget it. You, you travel to mm -hmm. places that are meaningful to mm -hmm. your art. That's true, enough. So, yeah. yeah, when I go to the Philippines and do my studies in the Sulu Seas, I speak Tagalog. You know, I, otherwise they know I'll, I'll be the target for the for the Abu Sayyaf to shoot me, right? So I speak Tagalog, but I was covered by the governor all the time. You know, um, be able to speak with the Bajau, uh, the the Sea Bajau, you know, and and wrote work and reconstruct oh the Sea Bajau God. dance and music. All this, no, I'm not the only one really. I I, I like to be like a Christian Jit um, avatar in the way. Yeah. But Christian was the only one, but he created so many more. Yeah, I created yeah. this because I was passionate and Christian was the one who fueled it, right? Yeah. But then after I had work and before I retired from the University of Malaya, they, were, they have so many, many graduates who are now teaching in UM, in UPSI, in, other, in and Sunway. And are they as passionate as you? Yes, they are. They are you, learning the you curve. Trust them. No, you can't. I can't. I can't measure them against me. It takes time for them to do it, right? So some of them fail miserably, but they know where they fail. <laughs> you know, and we have communicate. We put into communication all the time. I would put them into seminars. I, when there is an international conference, I create panels for them, and yeah. I mentor them, and we run our dry runs before we go. So and we publish together. And you're proud of. I'm very proud of all of them. I'm so proud of all. I of want. Them. I want to ask you about um, when our uh, your your name is synonymous with uh, with uh, Zapin. And then after that, there, there's another one that we'll talk about later, a bit later. But Zapin. Zapin, <laughs> Dr. Anis, is such a beautiful Malaysian uh, dance, uh, embodies so much uh, feeling, and especially for the man, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Especially for the male. Mm -hmm. Or is it only for the male? It is actually for the men because the tradition came from the Hadramais, from Hadramaut. Uh, it's uh, the Hadramaut Hadramis uh, perform their zafin, but they are they are very different from the Malay zafin. Uh, they perform it for very specific reasons, which I cannot go on now for lack of time. But but you, I think I think um, you can have another session on that. Okay, you know, okay. uh, but uh, what happened is this, and this is a very special part of it, right? I concentrate in Johor simply because I find. Johor Malays are, are one of the most outstanding Malayu in the whole peninsula really? of Malaysia. Really? Omar would be happy because, to hear that. Because there is simply no monolith Malayu in Johor. There is no such thing as a bangsa Johor. I must excuse uh, people, oh. you know. When you say bangsa, it means a nation, I know, right? I know, I know. It doesn't. Yes. Johorians come from all over. You know, there are Banjaris, right. Johorian, or a descent group. There are Bugis, descent group. There are Kampar. You know, and and all Jambi and all that. You know that made Johor. Remember, Johor was a forest 
uh, just pristine virgin falls you know, after the fall of Malacca. So you are not from Johor? No, no, it doesn't matter, Faida. I'm finishing <laughs> this Johor stuff, you know. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that the intellectual capacity of sel being selective is so right. powerful in Johor. The best of politicians, the best of writers, the best of structure. Oh my goodness. All of them are from Johor. You I remember the Angkatan Lima Pulo and all that? Go back to that. Now, in the same manner, in the same, in the same way, the, the, the local, uh, this is what I want to, I want to talk about, uh, the local genius, I call local genius, are very selective in what they want. When you look at the Hadramis being a trusted community, practicing this wonderful tradition that has very close connection to Islamic values, they wanted it. But of course, they can't be an Arab. Nobody will allow them to be an Arab. So they created, they actually invented the Malay Zabin out of that, and it evolved through family lineages. It went to the village. It, were, it was performed by the villagers, performed by the family lineages. It was dormant until I came in to, to knock the sense out of those people who wanted to retire from performing Zapin. And the rest is history. You can always read my books and my writing on it. How many years ago was this? We started off in mid 1990s. Ah. Uh, and then. Thankfully, we, you didn't allow it to die. I wouldn't want to allow it yeah. to die. I'm, now I'm confronted with a lot of issues where people, you know, of course, refiguring, reinventing. But I, I can't do anything. It's a heritage, yeah. you know. But my concern is as long as there's a reference for it, as long as one can find a reading of it, it's okay. But there's so many of our performing arts that we are very proud of today doesn't have that. And we are lacking so far behind Indonesian and Filipinos and and the, the ties you know, in this issue. Yes. Why are we that way? I mean, yes. that is why I'm saying no. I think the research and publication must come ahead. Yes. Performance comes with it, but it is not just performance and then yeah. performance goes and, away. And, you know, your, your sentiment, uh, Dashan, is, is, is uh, all over the country and not just Zapin, of course, other things as well. Yeah. One of the things that is close to my heart is Borea. And my God, the Borea now is not like mm -hmm. Borea yes. it used to be yeah. at yeah. all. And there has to be some knocking of sense into the minds of our population mm -hmm. to please mm -hmm. maintain. You're talking about Borea now? Well, okay. I, I am not really wanting to... Start. I just want to tell you something yeah. about Borea. The yes. first thesis on Borea was written by me on the performative thesis. Yeah. Prior to that, Borea was written from the literature, from history, from text, from secondary sources. The first performative thesis on Borea, my bachelor's thesis under Christian Jeet was Borea. Oh. Uh, that was the one that has first time music and dancing and stepping and all that. And uh, that was because I was in Borea with my family for many years. Oh. And we won the Dendang Rakyat many oh, you, years. Where were you dancing? In Borea, Dendang Rakyat. Oh. You know, so, so I, I actually love Borea because my dad, my mom, we would, the, the, my dad, mom, and I would dance together in the chorus, you know. I mean, wow. how can you get a family dancing in a chorus? And I have a lot of history on Borea. So I know what's happening right now. It's simply because um, the authorities, whoever is supposed to be the guardian of the performing arts, cannot care less. They cannot be bothered. I mean, I just argued this recently with some very good people in the ministry. I said, where do you leverage huh? what is traditional, what is contemporary, what is creative, what is new? Because you put all that together, the younger artist who has no connection to the past loves to do all kinds of things that we used to do too when we were young. But without that connectivity, th there will be a very big chasm between the two and it's too late when you want to recall it, right? So that's why I think it is a need to do whatever I've told you just now. Mm. Um, okay, coming, coming uh, to this uh, later part of your life, I'm not sure whether this uh, is part of your later part of your life or has always been with you and that is the latest thing that has surfaced with your name uh, and that is the wrong gang and the wrong gang for me is such a beautiful mm -hmm. word which also also has kind of lost its meaning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. i mean we hear of joget all the yeah, time yes, yes. but wrong gang is such a beautiful right. word right so you are now uh, connected mm -hmm. to Ronggeng and how did that I, I want to revive Ronggeng like I did with Zappi perhaps, perhaps I think is my if the cycle of my life as a Brahmacharya you know now I would say that perhaps Ronggeng would be my last if I could do it revive because it took so many years for Zappi Ronggeng the reason why Ronggeng is that everyone who does Ronggeng in North Sumatra in Jakarta in Batawi in Phuket Krabi Kotlanta Patani Thailand today 
you know, according to Malaya, being the, the, the birthplace for Ronge, and Malacca as birthplace of hybrid, and we have lost it in this country. Not, we didn't lose it all. Uh, we have lost a passion for wronging. So I have to reinstate the knowledge. People always take wronging as being a divianic thing because it's associated with Lady of the Nights and so forth in literature. And they are confused between wronging and Joget Modern. Mm. Wronging is very traditional. It has three uh, very atypical repertoires that has to be connected. The Sanando, which is called the Asli, the Inang, the moderate temple, from the slow to the moderate Inang to the very fast Joget or Lagudua. These are all connected in one cycle. And they are performed by the exchange of pantones. Wronging sits, and most importantly, sits with the success of the singers, not the dancing. It is the singers who can change or create the pantone, God, yes. accompanied with the music. The dancers come in late in the end. So people are confused. Oh, Honest, they don't understand this. Bring it back before it's yeah, too late. We, will. we have YouTubes now. You can always, if you want, you go to Ronging Melayu Nuspa in ah. YouTube. You will see all the revival work now. We have six already up on for oh, you to watch, wonderful. please. Yeah, that would help yeah. you to see what it is. I have a question from one of your students, actually. Uh, it's Mark Bode Silva. Yeah, Mark. Yes, Mark. Yes. And, and, and another student later. Um, Mark says, <coughs> uh, how important is it to, uh, to today's youth uh, about the art, the education of mm -hmm. the art? Mm -hmm. How important is it? I mean, absolutely, if you ask us, we will say very important. Nah. There's no doubt about it, right? The, the connection of the left and the right brain, you know, extremities. I mean, we all talk, in modern society today, we're talking about other countries, not Malaysia. You know, the emphasis on the art is so very powerful. UNESCO's pathway for the arts has been adopted by all countries except Malaysia. You see, uh, the, the footprints of the arts for cohorts HK12 all the way to adolescents all the way to uh, you know young adults are so clear because it develops the creative natures to which technology is connected and i think we are talking with uh, in malaysia with i think we're creating a left and the right hand doing something else you know juggling something without connectivity so if you ask me that question i say yeah i mean if, if you can see for example the most exemplary production of uh, technology and the arts look at those countries who Korea, who made arts compulsory. Look at Japan and look at China, who made people go to do arts and forcefully pick the best of the best students to put in the academies. So you are, uh, in other words, saying that uh, if you want to be an artist, if you want to learn anything about the arts, you must be educated in it. Definitely, definitely yeah. Definitely. You have to be educated. You know, for example, I look at this. We have young Dalang young traditional musician yeah they play because their parents or father or grandfather did it but they wouldn't last long you know the moment they hit the age where they find you know they have to leave they leave they had no other connection by experience but if otherwise see the person have historical documents reading about those traditional pathways and in being honored to be part of it they will stick this is what happened in thai classical music culture they have numerous publications. So the Renat uh, Ensemble remains still today as being very powerful. And we are trying to put people together. They don't have to put people together. They have six dramatic colleges. They have at least 12 arts universities, you know. And all of them are feeding crossovers, you know. And what are we talking about? You know, that is why I think, you know, there is a big overhaul whether we want to put culture in the Ministry of Education or reverse it, I do not know. But that's what happened now. The young artists are very talented. They are very focused when they do their work. But once they realize that there's no other means of getting away from it, getting something that is numerically good for them or financially sustainable, they leave. But this is the problem because they have no idea it could. Okay, what advice are from you to the younger generation who is looking for what should they be writing about if they are doing research on the arts, what's the topic? What's the, mm -hmm. What should they be doing? Okay, I, I would say, I, I, this is the same question my graduate students or undergraduate will ask me. I would say, follow your heart. You see, uh, no one can tell you. You, the, you. you follow your heart means it comes through the gushes of experiences, through your reading, through your exposures, through your presence, through your participation. That will make you feel what you want. No one can dictate you that. So someone can really write on very esoteric systems. Someone can write on a very broad spectrum of performativity. Anything. 
And then you invent. Life is to be invented, I'll tell them, you know. You, you have this passion and your passion, you, you focus it and create the trajectory, but you must keep on inventing to make the trajectory valuable to you and to the masses and to the people. I did that for me. I told them I did that in my life because when I started off, nobody, when they said, what are you doing? You're going to the University of Hawaii doing dance technology. What on earth will you be? I said, wait, because I have no idea. Wait until I come back. And I did. So I started developing the program. I went for my, I did a double PhD in uh, University of Michigan. So I was able to do both music and, and structural Asian studies. So those, those two PhDs helped me to put together what I put in, in UM. And eventually I helped ASK, you know, the Aswara story. I mean, people have a short memory. So never mind, you know, maybe one day on the tombstone, they will say the founder or so and so, you know. So we did all that. But I'm not going to be regretful for whatever has or happened or will happen because I told everyone that a passion comes from your heart and your heart tells you with your experience. You cannot just dream. Dr. Anis, I want to ask you a question which is about the country that we love. And um, this is a very, um, a, 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 what you call it, a very con concerning point of view. And that is, we have Malays, Chinese, Indians, Kadazans, Iban, Bidayu, etc., etc. But can you tell us are you happy that we are a one nation? What one nation? As in one spirit. Really? One yes. spirit? I want to ask you, are we or are oh, we? Oh, we are pretending. How? No, 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 we are pretending. We are pretending. We are on, we are playing, <laughs> we are playing how behavior. Do we, how do we, how do we solve this? Because how? we are never organic about it. <clears throat> For example, I tell you one example. Why is it when I go to Sabah and Sarawak, I feel very comfortable than being in Menanjo? Why is it when I go to Sabah, I, when I do my Kaamatan uh, festival or the Gawai festival in Kaamatan, in Sabah, Gawai, I could go to the long house for one week. I couldn't come back because they're all drunk. You go up river for three hours, you can't come back because all my boat drivers are drunk for one week. So I would stay, I would stay with them. Uh, they are drunk, I would stay with them and we'll learn whatever they do. And, you know, there is nothing about being you know, whoever you are, you're just another human being sharing this culture. They could be Christian, they could be pagan, they, some could be Muslim. So mm. what? You know, that is the leveraging we need, right? At the point where you leverage yourself to be one of the many and not be imbued by any kind of spectrum of differences, you know, then we achieve that level. We are not at this point of time. We are a racist nation and uh, our young are being forced to believe into the racist square so I think we are really in a very troubled time soon if we don't solve this issue. Yeah. I don't think you're going to love. The, I don't think even uh, the audience would love to uh, love to hear this. But it's very true no, because we grew true. up. You and I, we grew up in the British time, you know, and then we saw the independence and we saw how this country was created. We saw how the split happened with Singapore and before nineteen sixty nine. Sad and frightening. Yeah, and now what happened? We we can be speaking so many languages. The young yeah. boys well, and girls, they can only speak Hokkenwa. one language, <laughs> and that's it, they do, you know. Come on, they, try your Hokkien on me. We're silent now, you know. Look, 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 look. Dr. Ranis, um, we, we, we need to uh, uh, fold up this uh, interview. Yes. Uh, yes. It's so short, we should be talking to you for three hours. But uh, <laughs> just let me know, just let us know, how would you like to be remembered oh i i don't even want to think about how i would like to be remembered i really don't like that question at Bad all question okay no i don't <laughs> i don't i rather go at peace and nobody will do all this uh no, but you we know want to. anniversary of this and anniversary of that you know i just i just want one thing in my life though i my dream is that that whatever I've written... A great husband. No, no, no. Husband and wife, they also go and disappear. <laughs> uh, what I love is, because I'm passionate about it, that uh, whatever I've written, I've published, uh, will help our younger generation to find their pathways forward. Hmm? Thank you so much, Dr. Anne. I have just one uh, moment of my life that I wish I was your student. I wish I had gone to University of Malaya. The, those wishes don't come by. It's easy. good lah. It's good that we yeah, didn't meet I, there lah. I, I went to Kotabaru. No, no, it's good. We do. I can, I can tell you that. <laughs> no. Uh, but no, meeting now with you talking like this is the greatest thing that has happened to our life, right? Mm. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming.
uh, and talking about with us at uh, KLPSC and the Access Studio. And uh, if this is this is a magical moment, and I really want everybody to have a look at this and to digest what Dr. Anis has said. It is so so very important. It is a brief moment, but a very important.